Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The words of Scripture for us to consider today are found in Paul's second lesson to the Thessalonians, his first chapter beginning at verse 5. This is evidence of God's righteous verdict that resulted in your being counted worthy of God's kingdom, for which you also suffer. Certainly, it is right for God to repay trouble to those who trouble you, and to give relief to you who are troubled along with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his powerful angels, he will exercise vengeance in flaming fire on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Such people will receive a just penalty, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from his glorious strength. On that day, when he comes to be glorified among his saints and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. This is the word of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in, in Christ Jesus, I expect that uh, most of you, if not all, have been keeping our nation in prayer here recently. You know what's coming up day after tomorrow. Actually, no, not tomorrow. Three more days, right? This is election day. Right? It's an important day this next Tuesday. And Friends, I, I don't speak of politics here from this pulpit. I'm not going to give you a list of candidates to vote for. But I do want to point out that it doesn't take very long to make a list of platform positions and political statements that do contradict God's Word. Unfortunately, you can name many of them. Because politics is about getting votes, and votes are oftentimes gotten by letting people be selfish and indulging their selfishness. I think it would be a lot shorter list to find uh, those positions and places where what is presented by a political candidate or party is actually something that supports and goes along with biblical ethics. I say, as you pray about who you're going to vote for, let that biblical comparison be a major point in your decision about for whom to vote. Compare their records and their positions with the words of the Bible, and then, friends, vote according to your conscience. And pray for the USA. With that introduction and those thoughts of this important time that we are in, I want to share with you something someone shared with me not long ago. He made sure that I would take a look at a YouTube video posted rather recently about someone reading the Bible in public who was being shouted down and a big confrontation occurred. That makes our, us wonder and worry, perhaps. And I don't know the details, didn't even see the whole incident leading up to that, but words of caution on both sides there. Obviously, that, that shouting down someone who's reading the Bible, we would not support that. But I would also venture to say, be wise in how you share the Bible. And shouting the Bible's words in someone's face is probably not the most loving way to share God's Word. The point is, dear friends, we approach this situation with wisdom when it comes to persecution. Because persecution is nothing new. Persecution of Christians is nothing new. The history of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians makes that clear. Uh, Paul and Silas had just been in the city of Philippi, and, and there they were arrested and put in for proclaiming the name of Jesus and doing good. 
When city officials came and apologized them, to them for being unjustly imprisoned, they were escorted out of town and basically told make themselves scarce. They went on to the city of Thessalonica, the people that were recipients later of this letter, and there Paul and Silas shared the gospel again, uh, revealing the truth that Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, and that he is the Savior, he has opened heaven's door, and he forgives their sins. And it brought great success in that city, that proclamation. In only three weeks, many people believed. But that's when the opposition from Philippi followed Paul and Silas to Thessalonica. Opponents from Philippi came to Thessalonica, and another riot occurred. Paul and Silas had to leave town. It's in that setting that the Apostle Paul writes this letter, the two letters to the Thessalonians. He is fearing that they are being persecuted. And in that first letter, he, he encouraged them to stand up under persecution. And in this letter, the second letter, the Apostle Paul celebrates the fact, thanks God that they have remained firm in the faith in spite of persecution, and he encourages them even more. Those words not only apply to the Thessalonians, uh, they apply to you and to me as well. And we take to heart the truth that when Jesus returns, he returns with judgment. And that is an encouragement for Christians who face trouble. The thing that met opposition when Paul preached in whatever city he went to was that people had misunderstood the law of God. It still happens today. But what did they misunderstand about it? They ultimately thought that they could obey it well enough to make God happy with them. But they could not. They could not be perfect as God demands perfection. So part of Paul's message, his Christian message, was to share the truth that his audience was made up of sinners who had disobeyed God. They could not earn God's favor. And so often, people would get angry. Rather than recognize their sins and their shortcomings, they became defensive and even accused Paul of subverting the government. That's one of the accusations that was brought up in Acts chapter 17, claiming that the Christians defy Caesar's decrees and say that there's another king, one called Jesus. In the Roman world, this treason, saying there was another king, was a serious crime. The crowds may have even thought it was their civic duty to oppose Christians, ones who trusted Jesus and worshipped him as their king. Only, dear friends, you and I know, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. The Apostle Paul even encouraged Christians to be good citizens and to respect the governing authority, even the emperor in Rome. And as that encouragement is given to recognize the position of this earth, we realize that Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom where he rules in our hearts and he provides us with forgiveness and rest and glory that all humanity can share in receiving the presence of God, being in the presence of God through the work of Jesus Christ. This was God's answer to sin and our shortcomings, not making us strong enough to do it on our own, but giving us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see, governments do not provide, and whatever answer they may provide for the the physical problems we might face from time to time, or even severe, severe problems, governments will never provide an answer that overcomes sin. No government can tell us how we can get to heaven and God's presence, except Christianity. Christianity will tell us that. And when a proclaimer, a, a believer proclaims the gospel of God's grace, free in Christ Jesus, opposition will so often result. 
Uh, Paul makes a surprising explanation in our text about what that suffering reveals. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. It's a good thing to suffer. Why is it a good thing to suffer? Look at how it describes being counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Years earlier, when the apostles were flogged and imprisoned, ordered not to speak in the name of Jesus, when they left the Sanhedrin, that ruling court, this is how they described their re-entry amongst their friends in, in Christianity. They were rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering. Worthy of suffering. This is true in Thessalonica. No servant is above his master. Jesus himself said that. So we can expect to suffer just as Jesus did. Not for being angry in our presentation of God's word. No, we suffer like Jesus did when he was lovingly sharing the truth about God. And how it applies to human hearts and how it answers our questions in a way that human wisdom never that does make people angry. And when people get angry about that, and we suffer from for sharing that truth, we share in our Savior's suffering. And yet because persecution, suffering is not easy, Paul pointed ahead to the end of time as he directed these Thessalonian believers to anticipate the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. When that persecution when that trouble would end. Listen to verses 6 and 7. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. The Lord's judgment, friends. The Lord's judgment has two sides, kind of a two-sided sword. The side that cuts down those who have rejected Jesus for their eternal suffering, their eternal punishment. But that has a positive side for you and for me. The vindication that we are on God's side. That we have the victory. The truth that our suffering will and does end. It means something today. To know that God is protecting us. He is protecting us through these trials and troubles. And he will bring judgment upon those who have rejected Jesus. God would repay with judgment those who had oppressed and persecuted the Thessalonians. The Lord's second coming... Friends, it's not going to be like his first. You know his first coming? His first coming um, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus came mounted on a donkey, right? Humble, gentle, riding on a donkey. Hear the difference in the second coming of Christ? He will come from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, dear friends, this word obey talks about the obedience of faith. Not obeying all of God's laws because we're incapable of doing that. But we obey our Lord Jesus Christ by, by believing that what he did for us applies to us and overcomes and forgives all of our shortcomings. The point is, friends, that those who opposed Paul... Those who hurt Christians because they reject the free gift of salvation in Christianity, they will be judged based on that rejection. And that judgment will fall upon their own heads when Jesus Christ returns with payback. But let's look again at the positive nature of this judgment, that there is relief for those who believe. There is relief for you and for me. The, the trouble that our eternal guard brings to those who trouble us is actually something that provides you and me 
with sin, uh, with relief, with peace. It, it overcomes that effect of sin that we are living in right now. It signals that there is a time when the trouble of sin will be gone forever. Our suffering will continue here on earth because we live in a world of sin, but the end of that suffering will come. And we look forward to that judgment. That's an application that should be comforting for you and for me, in addition to how it comforted the original Thessalonian Christians. I think of a friend of mine, uh, an adult confirmand that, that joined our church a few years back, who, before she came to church, she never went anywhere on Sunday morning. She lounged around, maybe walked around, said hi to a few neighbors. But once she came to know Jesus, she always wanted to be in church every Sunday morning. And she dressed up nicely to show God how much she appreciated being a recipient of his love and his forgiveness. And she shared with me that because of that newfound Sunday morning activity, every Sunday in church when her neighbors still slept in and didn't have a thought in the world of going to church, she felt social rejection. She was called a holy roller. She was insulted as the neighbors made snide comments as her husband had a hand in, in helping with the uh, collection count and then taking the money to the bank. The snide comments, oh, how much was your take of the people's gifts today? She felt bad because of those persecutions. Because of that verbal, verbal anger that came out against her. Paul presents what awaits those who reject Jesus by troubling his followers. What's going to come to those who trouble Christians? Verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, this includes you. Because you believed our testimony to you. Those who do not believe the truth of our Lord Jesus will be shut out from God's presence. But not you, dear friends. By faith in Jesus Christ, because you have been washed in the waters of baptism and receiving the sacrament of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, you are guaranteed relief in heaven. The presence of God with God forever. That is what waits God's holy people. And think about that as you also think about how you may suffer. Maybe it's a snide comment. Maybe it's the end of a friendship because of a situation that has presented itself where you would not go along with an unchristian activity. Perhaps it's your loving words, the tough love to correct someone who is wrong is interpreted as intolerance and they reject you. Sometimes even a break in families and relationships because of that tough love that we share. Whatever way you have been persecuted, whether it has been physical, which I'm not sure any of us have suffered, or verbal abuse, or just anger. Think of those things in comparison to the truth of being with God forever in heaven. We, we sang the words in the song right before the sermon, uh, words that echo uh, the praise and glory and honor and thanks that we're going to get the privilege to sing in front of God, joining together with the holy angels, proclaiming that praise forever. Those words from the refrain of the song are a paraphrase of what's found in the book of Revelation. That song of the saints before the throne joining the angels and saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. God makes all of this happen by the gospel. 
And the Thessalonians believed it. Dear friends, the Holy Spirit has brought you and I to believe it as well. That God still works in this gospel. That when Jesus returns with payback, he returns to take us to be with him forever in heaven. No, you don't need to focus on how you have been ridiculed for your faith or whatever else it is. May be. Recognize the Lord will bring payback and reversal of the conditions, and you will enjoy his presence forever. Listen to how, as I conclude this sermon, listen to how the Apostle Peter describes God's judgment through Christ Jesus and the relief that it gives to you and to me. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Amen.